So, good morning. As we continue our series of messages where we're just talking about some of the basics of, some of the basic teachings, the basic doctrines of the Bible and Christianity, today we're going to deal with one that don't talk about a lot, spiritual warfare. Um, we need to talk about it probably more than we do. I think C.S. Lewis was right in screw tape letters when he said, people tend to go to one extreme or the other when dealing with things, spiritual warfare or, or, or Satan or the demonic. On the one hand, people minimize and act like it's a joke, he's a cartoon, don't take it seriously at all. On the other hand, people can go to the extreme of seeing everything as demonic. You know, everything is the devil, you know, made me do it and doing it and, 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 and it almost become superstitious. But I think Jesus gives us a good example of a perspective that we ought to take when we see that Jesus, for instance, heals many people and he also frees people of demons. But every time he heals somebody, he doesn't say, you know, Come out, demon of leprosy. Come out, demon of blindness or something like that. Uh, on the other hand, there are times when the, 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 the demons cause da damage to somebody, but he, he, he heals them from demonic possession. Some things is just sickness. Some things are demonic. Now, if you were to put yourself on that scale of b b between not taking it seriously at all and becoming almost superstitious and giving Satan more credit than he deserves, where do you think you fit? I wonder how many people feel defeated or discouraged. And part of the reason for the defeat and discouragement is that they're in the middle of a spiritual battle, but not even aware that it's a spiritual battle that you're in the middle of. I wonder how many more victories God would give us if we were engaged in the battle the way that the Bible tells us that we can so we can win. Helping us this morning talk about this is our good friend, Bill Smith. Would you Thank give you. him a warm welcome here this morning? <laughs> um, Bill is great to share just first of all because I like any excuse I have to have Bill share with us. Second, though, um, Bill's lived in the United States and so he understands the minimization of spiritual warfare and, and, and where uh, spiritual warfare isn't quite as obvious. At the same time, he's been a missionary for decades in places and he's helped with missionaries who are in places where demonic influence and attack is very visible, and they deal with demon possession and, 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 and uh, exercising demons from people as just a normal way of, of doing ministry. And so Bill has a great perspective, a unique perspective, I think, that he can help us with today. Now, before we go any further, let's begin with some scripture to give us a foundation for our conversation. What does the Bible say about Spiritual warfare, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober-minded and alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him firm in the faith. Peter takes it very seriously. The devil's real and he's prowling and he wants to devour. James, the half-brother of Jesus, writes in James 4, 7, Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. 2 Corinthians 10, 3, the Apostle Paul, who deals with all kinds of spiritual warfare in his life, says, although we live in the flesh, we don't wage war according to the flesh, just physically, just mentally, just in our own strength. But since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God, for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we ask your presence to be unhindered in this place, that you would win the spiritual battle in this place this morning, that you would be glorified, that we'd hear your voice and follow. 
Through Christ we pray. Amen. I think the place we need to begin with spiritual warfare is, first of all, appreciating its reality, being able to see the reality of spiritual warfare that we're engaged in around us. So I've asked Bill if he would share with us his perspective and maybe some stories about uh, the reality of spiritual warfare that you've seen in various places. Sure. Um, hey, first of all, I don't speak about this most of the time. I'm talking, usually I'm talking about Jesus and preaching about God, but the devil is real and he's prowling around and, and we need to be aware of that. Um, you and I went to Nepal. Uh, there's a Nepali family that I know very well. I've been getting a lot of emails and pictures from them this week. And one was a picture of a really attractive young couple. They have a, a one-year-old child. And, and my Nepali friend just said, uh, this is a family that was demon-oppressed. We prayed. They were delivered. Then they accepted Christ. And now they're in discipleship. A couple of days later, I got another picture of another young couple. This one don't have any children. There was an illness in the family. They were prayed for. They were healed. And now they're in a discipleship. Christ. That's, that's pretty normal in Nepal in which there's spiritual things. And then there's using the gospel. Um, for many years, I worked in uh, China. I remember down in Yunnan province, uh, a young American lady, single lady, English teachers working at Chinese university, witnessing to a lot of students. I remember when one of the Chinese students came to faith. It was, it was a pretty dramatic thing because as a child, that Chinese student had been used as, uh, her mother was a spirit medium and used to call spirits through her and then get a lot of money for prophecies, projections, and curses, and that kind of thing. So this, this girl had grown up being the, the instrument her mother had used to call demonic powers out. Well, she became a believer on campus, grew as a disciple. Spring break came. She went back home. She led her mother to the Lord. There's a, a joy and a transference. I mean, there's, there's a real joy in that mom that had never been there before. But she lost her source of income. People no longer feared her. She didn't have the influence that she had. And she said, no, I don't want this. I want to be back when people fear me, when I'm making money, and she rejected it. Well, a year or so later, I was back on that same campus. The mom was miserable. I mean, she looked like a hag. I mean, she was ill. She was miserable. I mean, it's, it's the exact kind of things that we see in the Scripture. Spiritual warfare is real. Spirits are real. People make conscious choices to put themselves under powers or to reject the, the, the power of God. Is that the kind of stories you're talking about? I, yeah, could, I, I could talk all morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, it's, it's good stuff. The, um, that last story, I remember when you told me that story the first time, you said there was this, her whole countenance oh, absolutely. Was compl had completely been transformed. And it reminds us of the story that Jesus told of the woman whose house was swept clean of evil mm -hmm. spirits, mm -hmm. but since it since her house wasn't filled, since she wasn't filled with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God's presence, God's spirit, then the demon came back, found it empty, went and found seven more, and and at the end she was worse off than she was at the beginning. What right, I, right. What I that what I think is really interesting about your story is first of all. I think people are attracted to the demonic. I think they get fascinated with the satanic because of the attraction of power, but it's a lie. It is a lie. And it's destructive. Mm -hmm. Well, the things that come from Satan are lies, and he tries to disguise good, his bad things as good, and, and people fall for it. But then people want power. People want influence. People want authority. And, and Satan is willing to lead them in a path for that. And it just, it ends up in destruction. I mean, yeah. I've, I've seen it there. I'm sure most of us have seen it here. Um, and the, it goes to the Second Corinthians passage, Second Corinthians 10, where he says we demolish, by, but, um, so we wage war not of the flesh, which, again, a first step in seeing the spiritual battle is just being aware, am I doing this battle just in the flesh? I mean, God has given us some strength in our minds and in our, you know, in, 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 in learning and in, in argument or whatever, but am I just fighting this in the flesh or am I, am I fighting this with spiritual weapons that are demolishing strongholds demolishing arguments, taking every thought captive 
for Christ. Would you speak to that of demolishing strongholds? Sure. I mean, overseas experience as well as U.S. experience. Uh, before COVID, I was going to West Africa three or four times a year. I've got a lot of friends. I'm still Skyping them right now. It's very typical. Go into a village. There's no believers. They've been under a lot of other influence. And it's just normal for believers to go in and pray to demolish whatever spiritual strongholds are there, that whatever has been keeping people blind from seeing the gospel, their eyes will be open. Whatever's been preventing them from hearing and understanding the gospel, I mean, it is binding the strong man. Jesus talks about that. That that is different than preaching. And I believe in preaching. It's different than doing all the other kinds. But going in and demolishing what has kept people in ignorance and darkness for generations. That would be a typical thing in West Africa. I've got friends in India. I mean, before we go to plant a church in a place that has never, ever had Christianity, to go there and pray that whatever's been oppressing, whatever is bumping, is bound. That that and that the power of God works. Now, that doesn't obviate the need to prepare your message, to study, and to use my fleshly brain to preach the gospel as clear as possible. But it's a spiritual battle, and in, in African, people recognize it's a spiritual battle. And again, I go back to, I wonder how many people are frustrated. They feel defeated, they feel discouraged, they feel depressed because they feel like they can't win. They're facing so many different battles. Mm -hmm. Or we even look at the world. I think part of the reason there's so much tension right now is everybody's trying to fight the battles in the flesh. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, 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 And God doesn't want us to be fighting the flesh nor to be on the defense. Let me put the challenge like this. Jesus said, go and make disciples. She said, I've come to seek and to save those who are lost. As the Father sent me, so I said, I you. How many lost people are you reaching right now? How many lost people will you reach this week? Not any more than you're praying for. Not any more than you're <laughs> praying for. That's right. Which you're making me feel guilty. Um, let's go back to okay. making you feel guilty. Um, <laughs> but, um, but why don't we, why don't we take those strongholds? Why, mm-hmm. why don't we have more faith because I'm afraid. I'm afraid I won't know what to say. I'm afraid I'll be rejected. I'm afraid. And so the spiritual warfare is more than just being on the defense because of Satan wanting to attack me. It is also being on the offense right. and taking sure. strongholds. Go yeah, ahead. T- talk, talk to both the offense and the defense. Um, I have been in this situation, you've been in this situation. We feel like we want to witness to someone and there's a little lie of Satan. Oh, you'll probably not be able to answer their questions. Or, uh, they probably won't pay attention to you or you'll lose a friendship. Those are the lies of Satan that become a stronghold that keep us from in love and in grace sharing. That's something we need to demolish inside ourselves. Not to believe those lies. You don't know enough. You haven't been to seminary. You haven't been this. That. You'll do a bad job. Or one of those lies of Satan. You know, you'll give the gospel poorly. They'll reject it. They'll be inoculated against somebody else. No, those are just lies of Satan. Okay, so that's, that, that's, that's sort of an internal thing. Has to be. But, but uh, Okay, I'm in the United States now. Okay, one of the things that is a lot of people are just really, really angry. I mean, every one of us, we know people who are angry. When someone is angry, they're not going to hear the truth. When someone, if, if, when someone is just consumed with anger, it doesn't matter how gracious I am, how biblical it is with the logic, they're not hearing. I mean, to me, that's one of these strongholds that Satan has put in people in our society here right now to keep them from hearing. Something... It's heard, it sets them off, and they are not listening. They're not processing the gospel or the love that you're sharing. To, to me, that would be one of these examples. He prays for us to take our own thoughts captive, not let us believe the law, but also to pray that strongholds and other people are destroyed. It, it, does anger permeate a lot of your friends? Does it keep them from hearing and seeing the good news of Jesus? Um, so here's the first assignment. So the first thing I want to talk about, though, is being aware, having eyes that see there is an upper story, spiritual warfare that's taking place in the heavenly realm that we can't see. It's not obvious to us, although it will be someday. Um, but pray for God demolish the strongholds that Satan has in his grasp that you might have victory, that we might have victory. 
um, I'm gonna, this is not, on both sides of the political aisle, there are lots of people that think our victory is going to come if we can win the next election. That what we really need to turn around this nation is political power. That's exactly what Paul's talking about when he says we don't fight with the weapons of the flesh. But what if we would pray, God, what is evil in, the, in, in Washington, in, in our political landscape, Lord, would you break the strongholds? What if you would pray that about your neighborhood? Then you're, you want to reach lost people for Christ or in your, in your company? Lord, break the strongholds so I can have a conversation that is fruitful. You, 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 what's going on in your house? What's going on? You think you just have problems with habits, with addictions? What if that's a spiritual stronghold that will not just be broken by counseling, although counseling is really helpful? It's not going to just be broken by med medication, although medication can be helpful. It's a spiritual stronghold, and you pray every day, God, break the spiritual stronghold that has me bound. God, break the spiritual stronghold in this house, in this marriage, with my kids, with my friends. So <clears throat> what if, as a church, we could be an army of people who are praying every day, God, break spiritual strongholds? Next, Bill, <clears throat> I didn't mean to talk this long. God's punishing me because I'm <clears throat> I can't breathe now. My, um, <laughs> as soon as I ask him this question, turn off my mic so I can cough. Um, you say people are blinded by... Well, I used anger as an example because I encountered that so often in the United Satan States right thing now. To strongholds that they can't see. How do you move from being blinded to the anger, or blinded to the anxiety, to, um, to peace, to joy? Oh, well, um, there's a, I think you cut my mic off. Okay. There, oh, dear. You uh, turned off the wrong now, mic. Now you can hear. <laughs> now, now, okay. How about now, that? Okay. <laughs> I, I spend a lot of my life frustrated with electronics. And so sometimes if we've got a great message, Satan just will sort of interrupt the, yeah. <laughs> all of that. that. That's an aspect of spiritual warfare. I don't, I wanna, I don't yeah. want to uh, embarrass the IT team. We've got a great team here. Okay, coming back to that. God says one of the gifts he gives us is peace, which means absence of anxiety, absence of frustration, absence of these other kind of things, which can destroy our concentration on God, destroy our concentration on what he wants us to be. Peace robs us of that joy. It's a gift. Um, I happen to think, you know, that the passage in Ephesians where you put on your armor daily and you put on the sandals of peace, that's something I like to do daily. And I will not lie to you and say I'm at peace all day. I have problems with Zoom. Has anybody ever been on a Zoom call trying to talk and the other face freezes and then you get that sound that we all know? And I won't claim that I was totally peaceful then. But I, but I recognize where my peace comes from. My peace doesn't come from the network administrator that's able to rescue me. But my peace comes from God who can do as he said, give me peace. How many times in a witnessing or a teaching situation is there a great distraction? And I can be distracted by mosquitoes around my head. I can be distracted by a lot of things like that when I'm in West Africa. And to say, no, Lord, you promised peace. And I'm claiming it right now. I'm wearing your shoes of peace. And, and he delivers. The, the, the point here is he's promised some things. We need to appropriate them. And if you call it spiritual work, you can call it whatever you want. He has guaranteed us some spiritual gifts. He has guaranteed to be there in the spirit in us and to help us in peace work through these. And, and I grew up in America. And yes, I've got a lot of degrees. And I study hard and I prepare hard and all of that. But recognize there's an enemy who is trying to distract and divert and destroy what God is up to and, and recognizing that world we're in. We, we are in a warfare where there's a spiritual being who's trying to disrupt what God wants us to do. And, and, and being aware of that and then calling on his spiritual gifts, his strength, rather than just our, our human ability. Um, would you continue on that and talk about how when we take 
when we, when we are on the front line for God and we're taking spiritual territory, Satan, um, Satan will do what he can to hinder that. Uh, would you kind of share the stories of the Apostle Paul, just by sharing P Paul's story and how he was opposed and yet victorious and that the reality of that spiritual warfare. Oh, yeah. Warfare. I, mean, I mean, all over the New Testament, Paul is saying, I am in this place. There is a great opportunity right in front of me, and many here oppose me. He saw that situation with spiritual eyes. Mm -hmm. Here I am, all these people who need the gospel. I've got them all to myself. This is a great, oh, yeah, and there's a whole lot of opposition. I mean, he, that just comes normal. Um, Paul had a desire to go to a particular place. He wanted to go to a place to preach the gospel. And he says, yep, Satan hindered me and I couldn't get there. And he was really disappointed. The next few verses, here we've got a vision for a person in Macedonia calling him and the gospel gets to Europe for the first time. Okay, I mean, Satan thought he had won by diverting, keeping Paul from going someplace, but actually God brought the gospel to all of us, anybody that's European background or had any contact with Europe. Okay, Satan thought he won by frustrating, disrupting somebody's plans. God used it for much greater fruitfulness and progress of the kingdom. And that's what we see all this about. That's what we see in our own lives. We want something, we try. Satan maybe wins round one, but God, God wins in the end. So first I want to see spiritual warfare just to understand it is real and, when, uh, and, and we have to fight it with spiritual battles. Second, I want us to very practically commit to praying for God to break the spiritual strongholds that defeat, that prevent, that hinder. Third, I want us in the middle of the spiritual warfare to be aware that greater is he that is in us than he's in the world. Again, the Apostle Paul's a wonderful story of, um, of doing God's will. Satan tries to defeat with opposition, with jail time, you know, and what does Paul do? And what do we see? Oh, Paul writes the book of Romans. Oh, Paul is able to preach in front of people that he would never get to preach in front of otherwise. It's like <laughs> Satan tries to defeat and you're going to feel like I'm trying to take um, land for, for Christ and Satan is opposing me and just having that peace of knowing greater sin is in me than he is in the world. What Satan intends for evil, God uses for the good. Speak then to us. We're going to go through a, a, a season heading up to Easter, 40 days of prayer and fasting. I, part of the reason I have this conversation is if you dare to draw closer to God through prayer and fasting and joining us together, you individually need to expect opposition. We as a church need not, should not be surprised if stuff happens that Satan is going to try to defeat as God's going to try to bring victory. Would you share <laughs> stories oh. that you have of that? Oh, there's, there's all kinds of stories. One, one of the first ones is, is not my story. It's a Bible story. Paul wanted to go to Rome. Satan wanted to frustrate that. Paul goes down to Jerusalem. He gets himself arrested. Uh, he goes to Caesarea. He gets to preach to two kings, all the Sanhedrins, all the key leaders in that whole society. Clearly, clearly shares the gospel. Then God puts him on a Roman ship and takes him to Rome. Didn't have to pay for it. He went there as a, as a prisoner. And he ends up preaching the gospel to the people in Herod's household. Okay, so over and over, there's a clear thing we want to do. It looks like it's frustrated. But actually, God used it for good. I mean, we see that over and over and, and over again. Um, and you have lots of stories of missionaries who have, and I, we have stories of church planters. You know, we tell them, be prepared mm -hmm. for spiritual warfare like you've never seen before when you start to start oh, a church. And, sure. and kids get sick and wives get sick and so often Satan attacks families. Oh, yeah. To defeat them and right. get them stopped before they can ever get sure. started. And sitting right here in the second row is, is my wife, Susan. We've had, had, we've had 55 years. I would not say we've had 55 great years. I, I would be lying to you. Uh, we've been married about 10 years. We went as first year Christian workers to Thailand. Um, language study was tough. I was very frustrated in language study. It was not a good year for, for us. I mean, our marriage is solid. But that was a terrible year. 
we were just beginning a new Christian work in a place where there had not been much Christianity. Satan attacked our family. Satan had us angry and frustrated at each other. That was, that was satanic attack. Um, I, I work with a lot of people who go to difficult places in, in the Middle East where they've not been Christians. David is a friend of mine. He said, my mama raised a house full of boys in Arkansas and we never broke a bone and I don't think we ever had to go to a doctor. And then here he is working in a very difficult place. Over and over, his kid fell out of a tree and broke a collarbone in this and was sick and so forth. He said, Satan is attacking my family. Satan yeah. knows how much I love my children. Satan knows what a key it is. And, and he's trying to totally distract and destroy my ministry in this tough place. And, and, and I see that over and over again. And so don't get discouraged because that's where you have to take a long view and not just a view at the moment and say, Greater is he than he is, me, than he is in, in the world, and God is going to give the victory. Um, and God used that those difficult years to help other people. Right. God use <clears throat> God uses the difficult years to make a, to strengthen our marriages, to strengthen mm -hmm. us. And so, as you're going through these things, you can say, "Oh, I'm being attacked," and uh, "Oh, this is this is horrible. Why is this bad stuff happening?" and and feel defeated. Or you can say. God, we are committing our lives to you, and, and, and we will not let Satan take the victory here. God, you have to give us the victory, though, because we can't get the victory on our own. Mm -hmm. So one, so want to give you perspective, want to give you some assignments, want you to, to don't lose hope in the middle of the battles. Don't be surprised when, you t I mean, I've seen it happen in new life over and over again when it's like, we're committing to new territory, and then out of the nowhere, it's like, wow, why did that happen? Um, now, I want to give you a practical way to pray every day for spiritual strength for the battle. If we can take a look at uh, Ephesians chapter 5, again, yep. or mm -hmm. 6, sorry. Yep, yep. yep. Jesus, they haven't moved it recently. Mm -hmm. It's still in, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. The Apostle Paul writes, finally... Be strengthened by your own power. Be strengthened by the Lord. It's a spiritual battle. And by His vast strength. Boy, is there greater strength than being strengthened in the Lord? Now, the question you're asking is, so how can I be strengthened in the Lord? Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. The devil's a schemer. The devil's a planner. For our struggle, the devil plays dirty, you say. Mm -hmm. He knows our weaknesses. For our struggle is, against, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil and spiritual forces in the upper story, mm -hmm. you know, is what we call it, in the heavens. For this reason, Take up the full armor of God. This is the second time Paul says in just a couple mm -hmm. of sentences, take on the full armor of God, not the partial armor of God. You need it all. So that you may be able to resist in the evil days. And having prepared everything, we've got to be prepared. If you're caught unprepared, ugh, look out, to take your stand. Stand, therefore, with, uh, with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, your feet sandaled with readiness of the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish with the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit, in every prayer and request, and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Now, if we can go back to the previous one, we'll go back and start again. How do you pray? You want to be strengthened in the Lord and in His power. One thing that you can do is pray through the armor of God. Go ahead. Okay. Um, many, many years ago, I used to be in, in the military. And, and, and I'm fascinated by the military illusions that, that Paul uses. Basically, in the Roman time, if you're a soldier, you're a soldier seven days a week. You never wore civilian clothes. You were on duty all the time. Well, now as a believer, as a Christian, I think that's us also. Uh, today's Sunday. We're not just on duty today. Every day, put on the armor. Every day, be prepared to be attacked by Satan. But every day, be prepared to share, 
to love, to be con- to gracious, to be compassionate, to be, to be the hands and the feet and the voice of God. Be prepared every day. So put on your armor okay. every day. Well, and let me interrupt by asking, how often are you conscious about putting on your armor every day? When I talk about the scale between the spectrum of not taking spiritual warfare seriously and treating it superstitiously, the fact that I don't every day put on the full armor of God tells me I am way too far over here. So the next question is, how do you put on your armor every day so you're prepared? Well, work through this, this passage is a very good way. Um, I have friends who pray through this every single day. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't do it every single day. Most days I do. There are days I don't, and those days are not good. But this is a great pattern to start the day every day to pray through this. God, I'm putting on armor right now. God, I want to resist it. I know the devil's going to attack me. I don't know how. I want to be prepared to resist whatever Satan tries to do lies that I might believe, that kind of thing. I want to be prepared, okay? I want to take my stand. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to retreat. I want to take my stand for truth, for righteousness, for justice, for whatever it is. God has me in that that battle at that time. Stand, okay? Belt. Oh, mine. Belt's a little covered over. I wish I had a few fewer pounds right here. But he, he talks very much about put on this belt of truth, okay? Years ago, I was a college kid. I was working in construction. I was a union member of common labor and hod carriers. I used to carry loads of bricks. I mean, this is long, long ago. I learned something real quick. You put on a great big thick belt, you can carry more weight. Your back doesn't ache. Mm. You are stronger if you just, just, mm. just put on that, that big thick. Paul didn't know the physics of it, but Paul knew if you put on the belt of truth, you're going to be stronger in God. He's going to sustain you. Have you ever thought about that? Um, not in that picture. That's, that is a great picture because people with bad backs have to wear bigger belts, mm-hmm. you know, and people that want to build, carry heavier weights, we mm-hmm. see in the weight room over here, mm-hmm. they have belts, big belts that they wear. Mm-hmm. So here's a question for you. How important is truth to you in everything, every day? We live in a nation, we live in a world of lies. Mm-hmm. You know, we live, in a, we live in a time where people say there is no such thing as truth. You know, there is no mm-hmm. such thing as absolute truth. And so it begins with this sense of Jesus is the truth. We love the truth. We are committed to the truth, not just what we want to be true. We're committed to the truth, not just pleasing others. We're committed to the truth, not just a narrative that we want to believe because of whatever reasons. We are committed to the truth and therefore living the truth and speaking the truth and walking in the truth. What do sure, you want to say? Sure. Uh, I, I'm a preacher. I'm, I'm a teacher. I do a whole lot, most of that online right now. So I know what temptations I'm prone to. Mm. I am prone to exaggerate a little bit. Mm. I am prone to get on a, get on a tear talking about it and maybe exaggerate just a little bit what I've actually seen. Okay, that's a temptation. That is beyond the truth. So doing this daily Don't let my mouth uh, outrun what is here. Fascinating. You know, when I was in high school, um, I did a self-study in psychology, and one of the teachers led me in. And one of the books he gave me was called Telling Yourself the Truth. Mm -hmm. Secular book, not a Christian book. Mm -hmm. But basically the idea behind it was um, if you're messed up, it's probably because you're telling yourself lies. Mm -hmm. So tell yourself that that's exactly what the Bible is saying. Right. It begins Mm -hmm. by capturing every thought and making it obedient Mm -hmm. to Christ. That's exactly what the scripture, capture your thought, capture your mind. Like, I mean, it, 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 typically when I'll say, God, thank you for my salvation today. I have a picture in my mind. On my mind, I go back to the passion movie and I see how much Jesus suffered for me. It just makes me realize my salvation came at a real high cost to God. And then when I picture putting on that, that tin helmet, whatever it was, the Roman soldier boy said, Lord, control my mind. Don't let untrue thoughts, don't let bad thoughts, don't yeah, rest in my mind today. Can take control of my thought process, yeah. And what does Satan do? He wants to fill us with lies, like your identity is in what you do, not in who you are. Mm-hmm. Your righteousness is in what you do, not in Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't have purpose in life. 
Um, if you weren't around, your life really wouldn't make a difference. You aren't loved, mm -hmm. you know, and you, you can't ever win kind of thing. And so it's like we have to capture every thought and make it obedient to Christ. The helmet, it's interesting, the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation. What's next? Okay. Helmet of salvation, belt of truth, sandals of peace. Okay. Well, I mean, sandals. What, what's the big deal about sandals? Basically, if you're not grounded in peace, it's really hard for God to work through. If you're anxious, if you're distracted, if you're frustrated, if you're not at peace, I mean, it's really hard for God to use us. Um, we went to a restaurant last night and had a conversation with, with a young lady that, that I, I, I think God's going to really bless her. Because we're at peace at that meal, we can look around and see people that maybe we can bless, maybe we can encourage. Okay, if you're not at peace, mm. you don't see opportunities. Mm. If you're not at peace, you, you, you don't even see how God could use you in this situation to be a touch of grace in somebody else's life. Mm. Does that make sense? It does make sense. <laughs> yeah, because again, I think, I think about how much anxiety, how anxiety affects us. The, the feet, how much do feet matter in battle? You know, everybody who's ever fought in the military knows your feet really matter. Um, and, and the feet keep, what do I do with my feet? I either stand, I advance, or I retreat. And anxiety makes me want to retreat. Fear makes me want to retreat. Anxiety, a lack of peace, keeps me from moving forward. Yeah. So yeah. if I don't mm -hmm. have peace, I mm -hmm. think, well, I'm not going to ask her how I can pray for her. I'm not going to engage her in a conversation that might be, might come across as too personal. Mm -hmm. But no, it was peace. And there was a peaceful, we never went to a place in that conversation where we felt like we were pushing something that was out of peace. Mm -hmm. You know, there's mm -hmm. a sense of God's leading this conversation. We'll just follow it as long, you know, and so... The feet mm -hmm. of, the, of the gospel of peace. Go right. ahead. Okay. Now, what I skipped between the helmet and, and the feet is that big breastplate. A lot of you have seen pictures, your Roman soldiers, you know, they've got some tin or brass or something on here. Okay. What, what is really critical here, it says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Okay. Do I sin? Yes, I sin. Do I do things I'm embarrassed about? Yes, absolutely. Does Satan use the lies that I'm not worthy to be used by God? Absolutely. God is saying here, consciously say, in God's sight, I am righteous. I have been forgiven. In the reality, do I do bad things? Yes. Do I do, say things I have to apologize for? Yes. But putting on the righteousness of God, accepting his forgiveness, recognize the truth on the cross, he paid all the penalty for my sin. When the Heavenly Father looks down at me, he sees me through the lens of the righteousness that Jesus has given. That's that, that breastplate. Don't believe any of these lies of Satan. God doesn't love you. You can't do this. No. I mean, to me, that's what it means. Start each day. I am forgiven. I, I am looked at by God through the lens of the righteousness of Christ. The breastplate covers the vital organs, the heart, the lungs, the splunk, <laughs> no, is, the, is the word in scratch. It's just a great word. It sounds like what it is, onomatopoetic. But, the, um, you know, you think about the, the lie of, um, one of the lies of Satan is people's identity is in their sexuality. What's my identity? I am heterosexual. I am homosexual. No, that's not your identity. But if Satan can get us thinking in terms of our behavior being our identity, he's just made us vulnerable in our hearts. No, our identity is who Christ says I am. I'm in Christ or I'm not in Christ. I'm, I, my identity is I wear the righteousness of Christ, and therefore I want to live up to the name. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? Sure. Okay. What are, what are some of the other parts that I'm looking at a scripture right here? Okay. In faith pick up the shield that is going to protect you from all of those fiery darts. Mm, I'm not sure I've seen a fiery dart, but over and over and over again, I'm in situations where there's harassment, there's something else, and I, in my mind, I say, that is just a dart of Satan to distract me and destroy my concentration, destroy this message, destroy this sermon, destroy this service, destroy this place, church plan. protect us. 
in faith, pick up the shield and say, God, protect me from what Satan's trying to do with the disciples, with this new church plant. God, it is more than my church planting ability, my skills to overcome. In faith, I'm counting on you to deliver me and protect me from all those temptations and all those plans and all those schemes and all those wiles that Satan is exercising toward me right now. Okay, so be aware of spiritual warfare. It is real, it is serious. Pray daily about the spiritual strongholds um, that God would tear down the strongholds. Um, be on the offense. Say, God, God has a great purpose for me. Lord, win the battles. Even though it looks like Satan is attacking, and he is attacking, he may attack through trials, he may attack through temptation, he may attack by attacking people that you love around you. But God, help me to know that greater are you than is in me than he that is in the world. And what Satan intends for evil, you will use for the good. So I, I live in confidence. I live not in despair, not like the world. We, fight, we, we fight not in the flesh, but we fight in faith. And then pray this every day. If you're feeling weak, if you're wondering, what should I pray? Pray through the, the and just, just spend time. I guarantee you that if you just start praying, God, May your helmet of salvation guard my mind. He will take your mind to places and you will keep praying that and it will be so powerful. Okay, Bill, you're not a preacher. You, um, you love the idea of being able to actually challenge people mm -hmm. the way preachers <clears throat> should challenge people every Sunday morning. <laughs> you have the people here and since I don't know how many, hundreds of thousands are watching you online. <laughs> what is the challenge that you want to give us today to go with? God can use you in powerful ways if you're willing to put on his armor, recognize the enemy, hear his voice, and go out in boldness. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are. I don't know if you're in a car listening to this, whatever. Here's the challenge. God says, I've got great and mighty things in store for you, but you've got to suit up. You've got to put on your armor. You go out there the way you are right now, you're going to get defeated. Mm. Suit up. And suit up is talking about all of the spiritual things that we just said. And I will do much more than you ever anticipated. He says, guys, girls, there's an enemy out there that is going to teach you lies and show you things and say you can't. Nope. In the Spirit of God, say, get behind me, Satan. God's got some things for me. Hmm. We're getting ready in our, this church here to go through 40 days of fasting. Probably what's going to happen, God is going to show you some new things, and there's going to be a great joy. At the same time, Satan is going to put you in the crosshairs and start trying to tempt and distract and teach you lies. Be prepared for it. Suit up. Don't go through this process without your armor on. And in the process, you're going to see God use you to touch people, to bring truth to people, to see lives transformed like never before. Because as this passage says, we're not in our strength. It's his strength. We're appropriating his strength by going through this little simple process. And dramatic things that I see overseas like healings and demonic oppression relief, sure. But dramatic things that I see in the United States, somebody who's never heard the gospel believes. Somebody who's been opposed for months and months and years and would never listen, they're going to start opening up and hearing and start believing because whoever has bound them has been restrained because of what you're doing. Would y'all thank Bill for sharing with us today? Thank you, Bill. <laughs> you're welcome. Yes.